A lot of people in history and fiction really enjoy having long titles in their names. For example, go look up the full title of the Ottoman Empire's rulers. It's, uh, quite long. And this trend continues in Warhammer as well. As of Age of Sigmar, Archaon's full title is Archaon the Everchosen, the Three-Eyed King and Exalted Grand Marshal of the Apocalypse, which fair's fair, I'd say he earned it. My insulin pump certainly seemed to think he earned it. But none of them have any more titles than the greatest King of Nehekara, ruler of the city of Kemri, and the man who would ensure his nation would be great for generations in life, and even greater in death. He goes by many titles, but all even remotely versed in the history of malice, anyone even slightly familiar with the great powers of the Warhammer world world, knows and fears the name Cetra the Imperishable. Come with me and allow me to tell you a story, a story of a great man who only became greater in death, and is yet another Warhammer fantasy character that proves the God Emperor of Mankind really just isn't putting the work he could be into his job. It's kind of a running theme if you hadn't noticed. But before I begin, let me ask you this, are you a male? According to my channel analytics, the answer is almost certainly yes, and even if not, do you know a male? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, then have I got the thing for you because this video was sponsored by Keeps. Here's a fun fact for you, and by fun I mean horrifying. Did you know that two out of three men will experience hair loss by age 35? I should know, because every man in my family aside from my grandfather was bald by 30 at the latest. And as enough of you pointed out in my face reveal, my hairline and Senator Armstrong's apparently aren't that different from one another. Thank you for all those lovely comments by the way. Well you know what Keeps does? It Let's you keep your hair. Eh? Get it? This fantastic service offers scientifically backed up treatments to prevent hair loss, and I'm talking endgame Stellaris levels of research with this one, so you know the facts are there to support it. And here's a fun fact about myself for you. Despite being a diabetic, I haven't been to a non-endocrinology doctor's office in several years. The mysterious pains I feel every day upon waking aren't that severe, so I don't plan to change this. Why in God's name did I bring that up? Because if you're like me and go into conniptions upon someone mentioning a doctor's appointment, you don't need to worry. You get expert level care from Keeps without ever actually having to visit a doctor, it gets delivered straight to your door. Not only do medical professionals with far more intelligence than I support it, but each treatment plan comes with a year of unlimited messaging, which means if you have any questions or concerns, you can just straight up ask one. If you don't think my word is good enough already, that is, which if that's the case, I'm a little hurt, but I understand. Oh, and despite the massive convenience of it being delivered right to your front door, there's no extra cost. In fact, Keeps is about half the price of pharmacy medications for hair loss. So if you're like me and you agonize at night over the time you lost $20 on an 8th grade field trip years ago, Keeps is perfect for you. Much like Soviet Russia in the early 1940s, it's time to stop that hairline from retreating any further. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash pancreas no work or click the link in the description of this video. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash pancreas no work. I have literally spelt it out for you, so what are you waiting for? Get Keeps today to save your hair tomorrow. Now it is time for the story of the man of many titles to begin. Before we fully start, and no this isn't a second sponsorship reading, I should mention that he's had two incarnations in a way. His first one was similar to the second iteration of Cetra, except he was only hated and truth be told he was kind of a shit king. Later on they changed this and I'll be using that version of him because it's a much better iteration of the character. Warhammer has enough characters that are nothing more than power hungry douchebags, I don't care to add to the pile if I can help it. So Cetra was not the first king of Nehekara, but he was by far the greatest they've ever had. The nation was by by this point well established, and though it was powerful, it was disunited and ravaged by war, and the kings of the time had pretty much forgotten what they owed the Nehekaran gods. When the priests came to him and told him that only with the gods' approval could a Nehekaran king truly reign supreme with the love of his people, he actually listened. Presumably surprised someone was actually listening to them, they helped Setra secure a covenant with his deities. The tasks required to do this included, but are not limited to, building statues, holding prayer service, and sacrificing all of his children to prove his devotion to them. If nothing else, I'm pretty goddamn sure his devotion wasn't in doubt. And sure enough, the next day after he killed all his kids, the Not Nile River flooded and ensured a bountiful harvest like never before, guaranteeing that Nehekara's long-lost wealth would begin to once more flourish and the people would forever love Cetra. With the people and gods themselves now on his side, he found himself with no shortage of military recruits and began reconquering the lands of Nehekara under the banner of his city, Kemri. As it turns out, news travels fast in ancient Nehekara, and many other kings outright swore fealty to him. Those who didn't, well, picture them as any of the armies that tried to fight Alexander the Great, and you've got a pretty good idea of how they fared. And while Satcher remained a cruel ruler as he did in his first iteration, he was not unkind. While Machiavelli might be one of the most misinterpreted writers in all of history, Satcher followed his teachings well. He was feared, yes, but also loved. Well, if you went against his will, you were going to come down with a case of murder very quickly, he treated those under him with respect and fairness. It wasn't the Imperium where you're just thrown into the meat grinder because it's easier than not doing that, he actually loved his people as much as he wanted them to fear him. Quickly, 
all of Nehekara was under his control, but take heed of that sentence. All of Nehekara. Nehekara, if you haven't noticed, is not all of the world. In fact, if you look at the Immortal Empires map, it's not even that much of it. This was an absolutely unacceptable state of affairs. There were people out there who didn't know who Cetra was. To rectify this grievous mistake, Cetra sent his armies forth to conquer and spread his influence even farther. His armies reached as far as Austria, and according to the Warhammer Wiki, his name was feared around half the world. And you know what? I believe it. The High Elves and Dwarves might have been living their best lives by that point, but if Cetra rolled around, he would have shown them what's what. Oh, you have the toughest armor known to exist that have mastered engineering like no other. Very interesting, but have you considered 500 chariots to the face? If you were wondering how he managed it all alone, believe it or not, he didn't. He graciously allowed some people to help him. There were, of course, the Nehekaran gods who were undoubtedly honored to assist someone as majestic as mighty Cetra, and naturally, his citizens and soldiers loved him as much as they feared to even slightly aggravate him, for his generosity was matched only by his temper. And he also had his right-hand man, Nakaf, whose name sounds suspiciously like Nakash, but fear not. Nakaf was no necromancer, and it was only a slight possibility that he might have been descended from the Satan-worshipping Vikings. But to actually give the guy the credit he deserves, he was a herald bar excellence for Cetra. If something needed to be smashed, he was part Viking. He could handle that no problem. The Varangian Guard can only wish they could have been half as effective as Nakaf at killing things. But he was also smart enough to make sure he remembered everything about Cetra that was necessary to introduce him in courtly life and generally make sure people knew who he was. This might sound like nothing big, but remember, Cetra is very full of himself. While his heralds were undoubtedly paid very well, if you screwed anything up, you were getting your head removed. So when it was time for Cetra to make a diplomatic visit and his titles to be read off for two whole hours, Nakaf was the guy who had the unequaled honor of reading them off. He even got one of Cetra's old weapons, the Flail of Skulls, for his service. As time went on, however, eventually Cetra realized his greatest enemy was still yet to be conquered. Old age. While well, he lived for longer than any even among the not-Egyptians, whose lifespan was apparently longer than most people's, he was still slowly getting old and that just wouldn't do. And so, Cetra is the one who founded the Nehekaran Mortuary Cult and bid them to unlock the secrets of a mortal life. Across the Warhammer world did they travel, looking for answers on how to live forever. And fair as fair to them, they made some pretty good progress on what they worked on. They invented mummification so people's corpses still looked fashion show ready in death, and they prolonged lifespans by many centuries. Unfortunately, hundreds of years still isn't quite forever. Historically speaking, let's say someone has been alive for 300 years. They would predate the USA, and that's not saying much in the grand scheme of how long history's been going. Despite Cetra giving them a blank check and probably a few threats to motivate them, the Mortuary Cult couldn't find the recipe for immortality. Evidently, none of the dragon rulers in Cathay were green and yellow. Despairing that not only were there places whose armies he hadn't yet thrashed, as well as the possibility that in death everything he worked for would be undone, Cetra reluctantly admitted that there was one enemy he couldn't conquer. For now, that is. And so did he ordered the largest pyramid in the history of Khemri, and indeed all of Nehekara constructed. It towered over all, and while subsequent rulers would follow in his footsteps and build their own, none would dare make it taller than Cetrus. That would have probably been enough to make him revive himself, if only so he could pimp-slap whoever had the gall to do that. When his last breath finally came, he was entombed alongside his entire goddamned army. All of it. Just thrown in the massive basement of the thing, and presumably told that it truly was an honor to die alongside their king, really. Trust me. Though to be fair, in Cetra's case, it was an honor to die with him. In the original version of Cetra, the people rejoiced when the tyrant finally died. In the good version of Cetra, upon his death, the entire nation mourned the loss of the greatest monarch to ever live. The entire thing was covered in potent wards to keep it safe from the British, looking to do some aggressive archaeology, and the mortuary cult promised that as soon as they could, they would revive Cetra to bring about another endless golden age. They even said they'd give him a cool living golden body once they figured it out. The kings of Nehekara would do their best to live up to Cetra's legacy, and while they never could, that's no fault of their own. Imagine an Olympic athlete trying to live up to the standards of Kratos. Can't be done, but that's hardly something to beat yourself up over. Nehekara still prospered for well over a thousand years after Cetra's death, coming more and more in contact with the outside world, such as with Cathay, and generally being the best human civilization around. The Mortuary Cult learned much since his passing, furthering their ability to preserve corpses and death, and learning how to perform magic. The worst that can really be said was that during the reign of King Thutep, Khemri was looking a bit weak compared to the other cities in Nehekara. While Cetra would have thrown the mother of all temper tantrums at learning that his capital city was falling behind the others, if one city becoming less influential was the worst thing to happen during Thutep's reign, then I'd say he did fine. Unfortunately, that being the worst thing to happen was not the case, because Thutep's older brother was named Nagash. I've already covered him in another video, but to make it relevant here, Nagash's final act before his death, one of his deaths anyway, was to kill everyone in Nehekara with magic and revive them under his control. Unfortunately for him, he came down with a bad case of chopped into pieces, courtesy of Al-Qadizar and the Skaven of all people, but the damage was already done. Across all of 
Vesna Hecker of the Dead woke from their slumber. Some had been gone for millennia and were little more than bones, others were only just slain by Nagash and still had all their meaty bits attached. But of most interest were the buried rulers of the land, now known as Tomb Kings, and the armies they took with them. Because they took a page out of Cetra's book in more ways than one, their tombs were all lined with arcane wards and as such they were protected from the worst of Nagash's magic. They were revived, certainly, but not as mindless thralls. They had all their wits about them and came to with shock and horror over what Nagash had wrought. Of course, there were other problems to deal with. Let's run through a scenario. One Tomb King revives, and he sees that his son ended all the trade agreements he negotiated in order to make himself look powerful. He's probably not too happy. In turn, his son hates his grandson, who married a noblewoman from a family he bickered with his entire reign. Who in turn hates his great-granddaughter because she tossed his favorite throne into a trash heap. Who in turn hates his great-great-grandson because he tried to sell bits of her pyramid away to pay for his gambling addiction. This is a single dynasty's worth of infighting that comes up as a result of thousands of years of lineage all trying to have their own way. And I mean, how would you even fix that? They were all the rightful king is one of the problems. You can't say one of them had any more or less right to rule. Now imagine them multiplied across the entirety of Nehekera, as all of the dynasties have all of their members revive at once and try and take charge. Combine this with all of the fighting each dynasty would have with other dynasties, and please do remember this is all on top of Nagash wrecking the place with his antics. Things were not looking good, and the mortuary cult was completely unable to maintain any semblance of order. After years of infighting, they realized that without drastic measures, there was a pretty good chance the Tomb Kings were going to destroy Nehekera with their petty wars. And thus did Gren Hierophant Katep make a drastic decision, revive Setra the Imperishable and throw him at everyone so they all shut up for five minutes. On account of it being better than everyone else's, his pyramid was untouched by Nagash's sorcery. This also meant his army was unravaged by the war that was consuming Nehekera. The Tomb Kings may all be functionally immortal, but it still takes some time for them to respawn, you see. And Camry didn't see nearly as much fighting as the other cities, if only because no one wanted to dick with Setra's place. He woke up and pretty quickly went to smashing mummy heads together until they sat down and stopped stabbing each other in the empty rib cages. Anyone who refused to swear fealty to him had their skulls repurposed as self replenishing catapult ammunition, which was also lit on fire, so people learned to take him seriously again. His terms were fair enough. Swear fealty to him, when you need something you better goddamn listen, and you can fight each other to your heart's content, but for the love of God, when something important is happening, you better cut the crap for a few days. After that, he sat down with the mortuary cult and demanded they explain why he didn't have a body made of pure gold yet. They explained Nagash's shenanigans to him, and he was just perhaps a slightly bit peeved off. He banished Katep until he could come back with the secrets of a golden body so Setra wasn't just a partially decayed living corpse anymore and set to work rebuilding his kingdom. He would always keep an eye out for the return of Nagash and frequently tried to destroy his black pyramid. Partly because it was a massive eyesore of evil magic, partly because it was bigger than Setra's and that wasn't something he was going to accept lying down. Never worked though, unfortunately. He should have borrowed a few nukes from the Skaven. He was always successful at stopping Arcan whenever he tried to do something big though, so he wasn't completely helpless against Nagash. He also continued to expanding his ever-increasing list of titles with various exploits that would make anyone look bad by comparison. One time, some moron was dicking around with magic and accidentally opened a portal to chaos in the middle of Kemri, which naturally meant demons were now all over the place, pissing on the Tomb King's sandy lawns. Setra took this in stride and casually soloed a great unclean one before throwing the guy who started this whole mess into the portal. That solved things, if for no other reason that the chaos gods were scared Setra would walk into the portal and have words with them personally on the matter. Another time when demons were suddenly a thing, Setra was feeling generous and graciously allowed an arm of high elves to help assist him in getting rid of the chaotic threat. Not that he needed their help, of course. He could have walked down there alone and dealt with the problem by himself. He just felt like being kind to the peons who had come so far to deal with this threat even though they needn't have bothered. They even let them leave their lives after the fact. And then there was the time he burned down half of Norska to get his hat back. At some point, some idiot Norskin figured that looting from the dead must be easy peasy. Unfortunately, the dead he wanted to loot from were from Kemri, and neither rested peacefully nor well, at all, really. Setra isn't one to let a little thing like death get in the way of workplace productivity, after all. The Norskin did manage to get a mutual kill on Setra, so thank god he didn't go to any other place in the Warhammer world, or he would have probably burned the entire place to the ground. And by the time the battle had ended, the entire Tomb King army was slain. They gave as good as they got, though, and only 12 Norskin survivors remained from the entire army. They took as much treasure as they could with them, went back home, and used to become the leaders of whatever tribes they returned home to. Unfortunately for them, Tomb Kings respawn. And when Setra did, he was pissed. Not only had they taken his things, but the lieutenant of the guy he traded kills with stole his crown. He sent out spies across the world to find him, which wasn't really that hard. When there's suddenly an influx of a dozen newly minted Chaos Lords, all of whom are wearing suspiciously Nehekarin looking clothing, it's not hard to put two and two together to get four. As in, is going to make you beg to your four gods to put you out of your misery the moment he gets his hands on you. He set out, and soon enough there were twelve less Chaos Lords in existence, and several thousand less Norskins and Chaos Monsters in existence. Do keep in mind that Setra is roughly in Egypt, 
suit, while Norsk is in the Arctic Circle if we're using Earth terms. Do not fuck with his stuff. Anyways, now it's time for End Times lore. Setra is probably the best part of End Times lore, since the Nagash book wasn't total garbage and Setra's badass even to the end. But because the End Times make me angry, I've decided to take it out on all of you. Therefore, it is my pleasure to announce that you are now breathing manually, your tongue is not comfortably resting in your mouth, your jaw is limply hanging from your skull and you're not sure if you should close it or let it hang, and somewhere on your body there's an itch you had not realized until I brought it up just now. Now that everyone wants to cause me physical harm, we're ready to discuss the end times. Just prior to the end times, Setra had reawakened all the Tomb Kings at once to begin a great period of expansions so that all the world would love and fear the name Setra the Imperishable. Then they got word that Arkin and Manfred were fast-tracking Nagash's latest resurrection and rapidly switched to fortifying the hell out of Nehekara. To stop them, Nagash covered the entire land in magical darkness, which proceeded to do... nothing. They just kept building. Kinda hard to scare a bunch of people who may or may not have spent millennia dead by turning out the lights, let alone the skeletons that are largely just mindless automata. Arkin showed up to lead the charge into Nehekara, and how well do you think he did by going 1v1 against Setra? If you said Setra bisected him and chained him into his chariot, then you're correct. Unfortunately, Nagash was playing 5D chess during this time period and planned for it. Somehow, Nagash snuck himself into Nehekara using Arkin's body. I don't know how. I don't want to know how. All I can tell you is that some traitorous Lich Priest cast a spell on a different Lich Priest to stun him, and then Nagash reversed forward out of Arkin. Nagash has finally returned to his ancient home and begins doing dueling the imperishable. And after Nagash had not only returned to life in his strongest form yet, but devoured the power of the god of the dead Usirian, he still couldn't beat Setra. Setra Tokyo drifted around Nagash and his chariot for quite some time, until Nagash eventually managed to break it. And so they entered a battle of wills. Whatever the hell that means, I don't know, but Setra's willpower was equal to that of Nagash's. A reminder, Nagash is now for all intents and purposes a god, and Setra was still his equal. So Nagash, being the bastard he is, just swarms Setra in ghosts until he can pick him up. While he's manhandled, Handling him, Nagash demands Setra's fealty to him, and Setra responds with, Go fuck yourself, Skelly Man. Not, you know, not literally. His actual line was much cooler, and it's on screen right now, so you can see it. I'm just not much of a voice actor, so I'm not gonna sully Setra's good name by butchering his quote. Of course, as cool as the quote is, Nagash didn't really care and just blew up his body before forcing Setra to watch as he burned Kemri to the ground. It was in this moment, and only this moment, mind you, that Setra ever felt anything close to despair as his kingdom was torn apart from under him by the greatest enemy his people had ever known. That lasted for all of five minutes after Nagash left until four mysterious figures put him back together, gave him a Dragon Ball Z Zenkai boost, and bade him go north for revenge. I wonder who they could be? Four mysterious figures telling him to go north where all the evil Vikings are invading? Mystery for the ages, Games Workshop. Wow, very impressive. Anyways, after the not four not gods of not chaos tell him to go north, he does. All the way to Middenheim. On foot. Then when he gets there, he approached Archeon as an ally. Now, you might be saying, that's bullshit, GW's ruining Cetra, but in perhaps the only instance I'll ever see anything like this, give the people writing the end time some credit. Hmm, yeah, that, that tasted bad. Archeon tells him to kill Kolik Sun Eater since he's too much of a loose cannon, so Cetra does. He just kills Kolik the Sun Eater, one of the largest and strongest creatures in the Warhammer world, just cuts his head off. Before the Incarnates arrive in Middenheim to stop the end of the world, Cetra wandered off to who knows where for a while, having a good think. When they finally did arrive, Cetra confronts Nagash, telling him that the Chaos Gods resurrected him to kill Nagash. He then proceeded to behead a Dragon Ogre Shagath in one blow, which I will remind you is an enemy so tough even Gotrik and Felix struggled against one, and that he is going to personally kill the Chaos gods for daring to offer him a chance to serve them. He says that he will temporarily forgive Nagash for his transgressions, though his head is next after the chaos gods, and he is last seen bulldozing his way through the minions of chaos as the world falls apart around him. Just in case you weren't aware, this makes Cetra the single being in Warhammer, either 40k or fantasy, who is offered everything there is to be by Chaos with no strings attached, from power to worship and even a fully restored golden body like he wanted, and tell them to eat shit. Because Cetra does not serve, Cetra rules. Now that's how you give Chaos the finger. As for Age of Sigmar, there's been little word of Cetra. Now if you're aware of a certain character called Cetris leading a group of Stormcast called the Imperishables that just happens to have a special hatred for Nagash, you might be calling BS on this, but hear me out. There's a few reasons I don't think that's actually Cetra, or at least that's not how they're bringing Cetra back, truly. One, while the Stormcast reforging process removes certain personality flaws, and undoubtedly one of those to be removed would be Cetra's complete unwillingness to take any shit from anyone, he was so full 
full of himself that he told the Chaos Gods themselves to go to hell after being offered everything, and one of his voice lines in Total Warhammer is him telling elves and diplomacy that their arrogance cannot possibly match his because he is Cetra. Not because he's thousands of years older than even most of them, not because he's the king of all the Tomb Kings, but because he's Cetra. There is no chance he could have removed Cetra's arrogance on unwillingness to serve. I don't care how strong or crafty Sigmar is. Two, while they did axe the Tomb Kings, I cannot for the life of me believe they won't bring back some kind of Egyptian faction. Maybe that's a fool's hope, but I really think they'll do something like that down the line, and Cetra would be perfect to head that charge. Three, and most importantly, if I understand correctly, Cetra was Cetra, but GW told the author that created him they couldn't bring him back in that manner. Cetra sacrificed himself to tell Manfred von Kamstein to go lick bricks, and Stormcast Amilcar said he was gone forever. Aside from that being the perfect situation to go, he's not actually gone because he's so badass, it also brings the perfect way to bring him back as he was. He got blown up, the bits of his soul wandered the mortal realms for a while and found some spicy lost knowledge about the old world, bing bang boom, he's Cetra again. But for now, the story of the imperishable comes to a close. Of course I don't think he's done yet. He's just taking a well-deserved break before he informs the lesser people of the mortal realms, aka all of them except the Celestin Prime, who is of course Karl Franz, of their place in life. And that place is to be cared for by the second greatest monarch to ever exist. The other option, of course, is to be used as more catapult ammunition. Thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the magic to my Tomb Kings miniatures, keeping me together so I can continue on indefinitely. Seriously though, look at these things. Magic is the only explanation for them staying together. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Seriously though, the Tomb Kings' characters are all more successful than the Emperor is. Oh, I'm dead? Cool, guess I'll just pick myself up and keep at it. Why would I sit on my throne all day? I've got shit to do. For anyone about to mention how the Emperor has to contend with keeping a massive chaos roof shut as well as lighting the Astronomicon, consider that someone like Cetra simply would not allow those to be problems. How would Cetra fix those issues? Well, he would intervene, obviously.